Hey everybody, you're listening to Chatting with Candace. I'm your host, Candace Torback. Before we get started on this week's episode, if you want to support the podcast, you can go to chattingwithcandice.com and you can sign up for our Patreon account where you get early access to episodes, or you can click that little link that says buy me coffee. Both things help me to continue podcasting. It's a huge help. Even as little as a dollar seriously makes a difference. So this week, I'm super excited. We're changing the pace a little bit. We have Mia Malkova joining the podcast. I haven't seen Mia in years, but honestly, she is one of the sweetest people in the adult entertainment industry, and I couldn't be happier to catch up with her. I hope you enjoy the conversation. So you just moved recently, right? Yeah, um, I moved from LA to Oregon. Um, <laughs> I moved to a log cabin, which is <laughs> where I'm at right now. Um, and yeah, I, I love it so far. I'm kind of in the middle of nowhere. So I, I'm like 10 minutes from a national forest. It looks so beautiful. I've been looking at your videos and it's like out of a dream. There's like woods and snow and babbling creeks. It's so beautiful. Yeah. Waterfalls everywhere, evergreens, ferns. It's extremely lush and beautiful. When and ins- I've always loved hiking and I've loved nature, so I'm really happy here. Yeah, so what inspired the move? Are you Were you still shooting mainstream or was this um, like after like COVID and everything? Um, so I had stopped shooting mainstream. I separated from my ex-husband a couple of years ago. Um, and I moved closer to my family, um, which was still in California, but it was a couple of hours away. So I still shot and I, um, I made the drive for a few months, but after that I started to really focus on things that I can do at home just cause I was really tired of, you know, driving three hours to LA. Uh, so I wasn't shooting for about a year and a half and, um, God, what inspired it? I was, I was wanting to buy a place and I was thinking Las Vegas just cause you know, it's a good place where a lot of people in the industry go. There's other talent, there's a lot of locations. Um, and I saw a YouTube video of Oregon. Um, yeah. And I just thought, you know what, that's what I want to make my content. I want to make my content nature vibe. I want to do something that I love. Oh, I love that. I literally just saw a video and I was like, oh, let's do that. (laughs) I feel like sometimes that's how things work out though, right? Is you just kind of get like a random clue and you just have like an instinctual feeling and then you know that's the direction you're supposed to be in. Yeah, it feels right. Mm -hmm. And then you just go 100%. Mm -hmm. And then see it and hopefully it works out, which it It seems like it is. Yeah, you have like a magical cabin in the woods and you seem very happy. Thank you. The question everyone always asks everyone, and it's so tiring. So if you don't, if you want to give me like the Spark Notes version, you totally can. But what got you into the industry? Because I think everyone has a different answer, um, and everyone expects it to be the same. So what's what's your story? Um. So I was nineteen, um, and I didn't grow up with a lot of money. So I was working at Sizzler. I was just a hostess there. Uh, I was very promiscuous. And my best friend, who I've known since the second grade, she didn't have a lot of money either. So she started doing pornography, um, you know, kind of just to make ends meet. And I found out about it. And I was a lot more promiscuous than she was. So I kind of just jumped into it. I, I liked the idea. Um, I liked the sexual aspect of it more than even the financial. I think I was Mm -hmm. very, uh, very wild (laughs) (laughs) at 19. And I didn't really think things through either. I didn't think of it as a career or Mm -hmm. or anything like that. I was kind of just like, Oh, that sounds fun. Mm -hmm. You know, that'll shock people. I'll go do that. That's so funny because I, f- I find that commonality amongst like the, all of like the top girls is a lot of them, there was another factor for them joining. It wasn't because they wanted to be famous and there wasn't because of money. And those are the ones that tend to kind of like rise to the top, I think, because you're not focusing so much on something that's not going to bring you happiness. Not that porn brings you happiness because everyone has like their own experience yeah. within it. But I think if you're f- strictly chasing that industry for money, you're going to be very disappointed.
Yeah, same. I feel like when I first got into it, it was like this magical thing and I got to like really explore my boundaries and my my sexuality. Mm -hmm, It totally is. And then when I decided to stop doing mainstream, it was almost like that it just didn't feel right anymore. I guess it goes back to like just trusting your instincts and then I just started self-producing. What is the biggest difference and how has – have you changed um, your perspective on porn now that you kind of self-produce everything? Um, I mean, for me personally, I still would – I I wouldn't go back to shooting like I used to Mm -hmm. just because I think it's easier to self-produce. I get to make my own schedule. I get to, my scenes are what I want to shoot, how long, my wardrobe. I'm not, I don't have someone back there saying, you know, talk now, do this, do that. Mm -hmm. It's kind of just whatever I feel that day. Um, So I like having complete control Mm -hmm. and I think it's a lot easier than traveling everywhere and spending, you know, five to eight hours on set Mm -hmm. shooting a 30 to 40 minute uh, sex scene. Um, I also, the residuals is a a big part of it for me. Mm -hmm. I'm growing my own platforms and I'm getting the income instead of just a flat rate. Mm-hmm. And then I, the companies will go on and, and they'll make the residuals from that scene that I shot, but I'm just stuck with this flat rate, which looking back now and looking at what I earn with my own platforms and even what other girls are earning with their own platforms, it's not a lot of money. No. <laughs> it's really not. And it's, it's not worth it. For some girls, as long as they enjoy it to kind of help build a name, I, I don't think it's a bad idea, but for the girls who do have a name and a following, it's it's not worth it in my opinion. Yeah, it's almost like an unnecessary step now. And I remember when I all these other third party platforms were coming up, like when the premium Snapchat became a thing, and now the OnlyFans is a thing, and then you know people are joining Twitch, which I definitely want to get into with mm-hmm. you. But you just start seeing all these ways that you can be your own boss and kind of have that control, and then you see what the money actually is, and then what companies were saying you were worth, and you're like, wait, there is a big discrepancy here. I know. I, I I'm not afraid to say it, but my rate for boy girl is fifteen hundred, which mm-hmm. Looking back, that's really not a lot of money compared to what they were making off of that scene. And I bet you were probably told that you were too high at that price. I was, yeah, I was told I was too high for a lot of companies. Exactly. I was one of the higher paid, which is crazy that (laughs) girls are out there doing boy girl scenes for five to six hundred sometimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then they both, I, it was the same way. Anytime I had a rate that was considered too high, you almost get like bullied and they're like, well, people aren't making money. What? You're yeah. making a lot more than you're paying us. Mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah. That's why I'm really glad. I think that the industry is going to hopefully move in like a different way um, and a more positive of, um, way for like the performers especially. Performers. I think so too. Mm-hmm. I'm really happy with where it's going. You've – always been really open. I feel like with – you share like a lot of yourself on social media. I think that's also probably why you do so well is people feel like they get to know you more than the girls that don't show their personalities or like their lives. Like you – when you were married, you had – you shared that experience and then you brought up the divorce. And how have you found love throughout working in the industry? Because a lot of people are like – look at us like unlovable creatures, which I – I'm trying to like break that stigma and show like positive, um, positive relationships that have worked out. Um, I've been, I feel like I've been in a relationship since I've been in the industry. <laughs> um, I'm a long-term relationship person. That's something I've noticed, but I was with Danny for, I think we were together for almost five years. We were married for three. Um, and then when that ended, I was only single for a couple of months before I started dating my new boyfriend, Eli. We've been together for three years. So like, <laughs> um, yeah, I've had no problem. <laughs> Serial monogamous. Yeah, I haven't been single the entire time. Um, and I'm really happy. Obviously, the marriage didn't work out. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I truly think that the relationship, I think it worked out for the best. Or mm-hmm. I know it did. <laughs> Um, and I'm a lot happier in a very healthy relationship now. Yeah. Do you, so do you guys ever have like jealousy talks? Do you guys have a very typical like monogamous relationship now? Um, God, we're kind of monogamous, but we're not, we're, we are in an open relationship Mm -hmm. and there are jealousy talks. Um, it's, 
it's really weird. I'm able, like, I'll shoot with other people sometimes. Um, and he shot with other people since we've been together. But, and I've even been with, I've really only been with one person off camera since we've been together. I'm actually really picky. I don't know when I got so <laughs> picky, but I am. <laughs> um, and it's really weird. We do have the talk and I like, I really like the idea of an open relationship because, and it's not just, um, it's not just for me, it's for the other person too. But I like, uh, there are people who I meet and I'm attracted to, and I'm interested in getting to know better and like sharing that, um, that intimate relationship with. Uh, it's just, it, it's kind of, I don't know. It's, it's hard. It's a little hypocritical. Um, just because I do feel jealousy. I, if I'm going to want that, I want my partner to want that and have that as well. Mm -hmm. Um, but <laughs> I am, I don't know when this happened. I'm a jealous person <laughs> and I don't want to be, um, it's normal, I think. And it's just something to work on. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. What about you? Are you in a monogamous relationship? I say that we're monogamish. So like yeah. there's like the ish there. Um, I haven't been with somebody else in years. Like, But that door is still open. And kind of like you, like I'm the jealous one out of the two of us, surprisingly. <laughs> He's not jealous of me at all. No. Like, he'll film my scenes. He doesn't care. I don't hear anything about it afterwards. And if he even just likes too many girls' photos on Instagram, I'm like, what is this? <laughs> like, what's going on here? <laughs> That's so funny. I Yeah, I've been that the same way too, to where like I would stalk like his online behavior. I was like, well, this isn't productive. This isn't helping me. This isn't even fair. What am I doing? But I can't help it. I don't feel – I don't know. I think it just comes down to – Unfortunately, insecurity. Mm -hmm. That's that's what it is. Is I'm feeling insecure in those moments. Mm -hmm. So it's just something to accept and work on. Yeah, it's almost like a muscle that you just kind of have to like keep working and keep like exposing yourself to, and then it'll eventually start like dying down a little bit. I, we like have almost like a handbook of rules for our relationship. So like, what's okay and not okay as far as being intimate with somebody else. And if that ever were to arise, like how do we handle it? And if someone's not okay, then we have to be able to have that safe space to have a conversation. So like if I was with someone and he's like, well, er, we don't want to, I don't want you to do that anymore. Then I have to be willing to adjust because it's like a living, breathing thing. That's, that's where I really, that's what our rules are too, mm -hmm. is to listen to the other person. And there, there has been even times, he's really not jealous, but there has been a time a couple months ago where there was someone I was interested in and, you know, it was coming up. I was like, okay, they're interested in hanging out this weekend. He was like, no, I'm going through some stuff. I really don't want to deal with that right now. And I kind of just had to, mm -hmm. you know, listen to his feelings and, and squash that opportunity, mm -hmm. which since it comes around so little for me that I am interested in somebody. It was hard. It was like, damn it. You know? I finally found one. Yeah, I found someone I was interested in. Um, but I think that that's just love and fair. And that's the only way it's going to work is if you respect and you listen to each other. Oh, I couldn't agree more. And I'm similar too in the sense that like we – when we started talking about potentially being in like an open relationship or like a non-traditional relationship, it was – the fact that I was going to be shooting and that's not fair to him. And I just saw so many girls in the industry especially that were like, I get to do this and because it's for work, it doesn't count and you have to stay at home and be like a good partner. And that's just not yeah. fair. Yeah. It's just not fair. Because most men, when they do have sex, it is disconnect disconnected, right? It is like a yeah. physical yeah. experience. So just because your work is that, it's the exact same comparison then, right? Like they're both disconnected experiences. So by default, it should be fine. Yeah. What about for you, though? Are you interested in connected experiences? Because I that is something that I've noticed. And I think why I'm so picky is I've kind of grown up a bit. And I'm less interested in the sex or uh, sexual gratification of it and more, hey, I respect this person, you know, and I find them attractive. I want to have not a relationship, but I guess a friendship. Mm -hmm. And like a level of respect with someone who I'm interested in sleeping with. But definitely, definitely an emotional connection in some way. I feel like 
Yes and no. So I get nervous if there's a situation where I find these other things attractive, like their personality and I get – I don't know, like an admiration because then I'm like I just don't want to ever get in a situation where emotions are entangled because – that's not fair to him. And like our arrangement is like no emotions just because like for me, I like that's where I can't handle it. Like if he were to have like, you know, dates and whatever, I just – that's my hard pass. So I just wouldn't want to be a hypocrite in that way. Um, But at the same time, there would have to be something else because I'm pretty picky too. So it would be almost – never that I would just see somebody at a bar and be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go home with that guy. I'm like, I'm probably going to end up like murdered or something. Like I'll talk myself yeah. out of it. Like it's not going to happen. So it almost – it has to be someone that I at least am like acquaintances with, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like a couple of, of exchanges so that I know they're not like a dummy or something. Yeah. Like at least that. Yeah. For me, I've just – I have just realized that I'm I'm not interested. It would have to be like Henry Cavill or or some actor that I fantasized a bunch about mm-hmm. uh, for me to be interested in just the sexual aspect of it. But other than that, that's where I struggle is mm-hmm. I want more of a connection if I'm sexually interested in somebody off camera, mm-hmm. um, but I'm jealous <laughs> if my partner would want something like that. So it's just, I think it's trial and error. It's just going to take time. Mm-hmm. Totally. Especially when it's like three years because like it's still kind of – you still have like that nuance, I feel like, in that stage of the relationship. I feel like we're married. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. We've been – three years, but we've been – we haven't been in LA. We've, we've been with each other most of the time. We're just with <laughs> each other 24-7. So I feel like I, I know him very well. It doesn't feel like a new relationship. Mm-hmm. I'm so happy. Thank you. So I saw um, – well, you have a million follow- followers now on Twitter, which is amazing. Thank so you. Cool. I saw that you were saying that you were shadow banned on Instagram. Is that still in effect? Yeah, I'm still shadow banned. I'm actually terrified because um, they took down – I was already shadow banned. And what happened was I had my Facebook connected to it. And I haven't touched my Facebook um, in a couple of years And there was a picture that was reported on it from two years ago. And so the Facebook or the Facebook I got walked out of and I ended up getting it back. But when I got it back, because it was connected to my Instagram, they shadow banned me. And then while I was under the ban, they also took down three photos and they gave me a serious warning on two of them. One, I'm just kissing a girl, um, which I can see how they would, and I was saying, go check out this, you know, go check out this other Instagram. I can see where that was pushing the limits. Um, but the other one was a very safer work photo and it had a closed flashlight in the photo. And I got a serious warning on that one too. So I really just think they're cracking down. Um, oh, wow. yeah, I think they're cracking open. down on, uh, no, it wasn't open. And then the other one that was taken down all a, it was a very, very clean, innocent photo, but the bio said, um, click the link in my bio, there's a sale. So I also think that that just hit an algorithm. Um, I'm just terrified. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, because that yeah. account's solid. I think you're at like, what, five on there? Um, I think I'm at, or I'm at like 7.6 now. Holy cow. I've put a lot of effort into my Instagram. It's like my main thing and I love it. I really do. I love... I love shooting the photos for it and creating the content. Um, And it's like a main goal of mine to grow my Instagram. So it's really stressed me out getting a warning like that. I went through and I've archived a lot of photos that could possibly um, be pushing the limits a little bit. I've always been careful to be safe for work, but I'm trying to be even more careful. And I think I'm going to redirect the content to less sexual for the future. Mm -hmm. still sexy but be a little more careful with angles so I guess that's like a good point though so do you notice that if you have more of like a curvy body that you're more subject to these things because for in my experience the girls that have like the more petite like I guess like pre-pubescent bodies get away with a lot 
like a lot more than the girls that have curves. It's like if you have a big butt, even if you're in a regular bikini, and I've seen this, like a not a thong, a regular bikini, it can get taken down. And it's like that's just not fair because it's just a different body type. Yeah, I've actually had that issue my entire life, even with bathing suits. I'll wear something, a a cut that another girl will wear, but because my butt is so big, (laughs) people will look at me and they'll be like, there's kids there. That's inappropriate. I'm like, what? (laughs) (laughs) That's not fair. (laughs) You're like, this thing has a mind of its own. I can't control what it does with a bikini bottom. I don't want to cover it up either. It's my best asset. (laughs) Yeah. No, I I just – I see a lot of inconsistencies. Like there's some girls that post like full nudes, like nipple, full butt, and they have, you know, 10 million followers. I'm like, this isn't fair. I see that a lot. Um, Something I think – I think that there might be a few reasons. Um, I think the reason that my account is struggling right now is because it is a larger account. So I've noticed that the the more that it's grown – the more posts get taken down. And I think that's just people reporting. Mm -hmm. Um, So even if it is safe for work, if they think, you know, someone is bored and they're like, oh, that's too much. That's Mm -hmm. too much. No, I don't like that. They're going to report. I also think I'm hitting more algorithms than I used to. Mm -hmm. And I think being a porn star and in the adult industry, people who follow me are more likely to hold me accountable for pushing the limits on Instagram than they are for someone else that they're Mm -hmm. following who's not in the adult industry. That's just my personal opinion. Yeah. I hope – I don't know. I hope that it starts to shift a little bit because you see like a lot of the regular Instagram girls that have the OnlyFans accounts now because of all the craziness that's happening. So now because it's becoming more normalized, I mean like Cardi B has an OnlyFans and she's plugging it on – on Instagram. So if that's the case, I mean, I feel like we have to normalize it a little bit. There's a paywall. So like my biggest thing with porn is I I think everything should have a paywall. Like I'm like very I'm anti- in agreement with that. Yeah, it just especially now because content is so extreme and it keeps getting more and more intense. Like I just think that there needs to be some kind of buffer between that and someone who just stumbles upon it. Mhm. You know what I mean? So I mean, when you do OnlyFans, it's a paywall. There's nothing crazy. I don't know. I just don't – I don't see the issue. And also, OnlyFans isn't just for adult performers. There are people selling their their art on it, you know? <laughs> and Cardi B, I don't know what she sells, but I doubt she's selling pornography. I don't know if she's doing, like, full-blown porn, but, like, Amber Rose is. So – and she's, um, like, you know, model, like, vixen type of girl that is now doing porno and she's pushing it. I think she also has like 10 million followers or maybe more. I'm not really sure, but it's becoming a lot more mainstream. So again, there's like a paywall. So I don't know if you're be- like posting safe for work and obviously everyone knows it's 18 and up. Like I just don't see the issue. I don't see it either. Mm-hmm. I don't. Even even posting the OnlyFans link, they, they can't see anything. Mm-mm. They have to put in their credit card information and verify their age. Mm-hmm. Is that why you don't post any uh, nudity on Twitter? Yeah. So with my Twitter, my goal for that is to start building it, I guess, like outside of just like porno. Like I I do like maybe one out of every 10 is like an an OnlyFans plug or something like that. And then the rest I just try to like tweet. And then I've had like some of my, I guess – not what, what would you call them? Like people that you like look up to, like I've had them start following me, like these, you know, neuroscientists and doctors and whatever. So I'm like, oh, do I want them yeah. to see this when they scroll through their feed? Um, so I'm just trying to be like very wary and not like do anything too sexual. But I would say after I had my son was when I started thinking more about paywalls like and getting a very like hard opinion on it. Um, and just like talking to other people. And there was some crazy stuff that came out with Pornhub earlier this year that was like pretty gross. Um, I don't know if you followed the campaign. Wasn't it like um, fake IDs? So underaged people were uploading pornography? Well, that was like the the least like ugly part of it. So um, stuff that has been proven and like there's been settlements. There were rape videos that got put up. Um some were of the girls were like very young, like I think like 13 or 10 or something like that. And 
their response was, we vet every video that comes up and we check IDs and blah, blah, blah. You know, it's such a large platform, like we can't be held responsible. And I was like, well, hold on a second. I email you guys every single week to take down videos that you guys take from me. Um, and like my company, like the ones that I shoot, and I know that you don't have the paperwork and I know that you don't have the IDs. So that's a falsity that you're kind of spreading. And a lot of girls believe. That makes perfect sense because I, yeah, I have videos taken down every couple weeks too. So how are they uploading these if they're checking them and checking IDs? Yeah, they're not. You know what I mean? And there's, I've shot with like super amateur people that aren't anywhere else. So how do they know that those people are of age? They have no idea or that they won't, weren't um, coerced. You know what I mean? Like there's no sign in or sign out, like any of that. So that was like a huge lie. And I didn't really like that. Um, so it was like, yeah, that's just like one thing that would kind of help with some of like those uglier things that are happening. And it's like a very easy fix. You know what I mean? And then everyone makes more money at the end of the day. When you were shooting, one thing that I always thought was interesting, it, we both had the same agent for a while, like the beginning part, like um, like maybe the first year of my career. And I remember him saying that you only shot like a couple days a week and that you were very strict as to like the scenes that you did and who you worked with. And I always found that really admirable. I remember I texted you before I started shooting Boy Girl. I was like, well, how do you do it? Like Because you mm-hmm. seem to build like this really good brand and – you seemed like one of the more mentally healthy women in the industry. Um, so I'm like whatever she's doing is kind of like the approach I want to take. So how did you kind of come up with those boundaries for yourself? Um, with who I wanted to shoot with, I got to a point where um, – and even how many days I wanted to work. I was very popular, so everyone wanted to book me. If they could have, I would have been booked every single day. And I'm actually a very sensitive person, and I'm very – introverted and I like peace and quiet and I need time to myself. So I was just getting overrun and I was getting exhausted. I decided, you know what? Um, it's not worth it for me. I don't need to take these extra days. I don't need the money. I don't need to do it. Um, so I started to limit how many days I would work, even what companies to prioritize. Mm -hmm. And as far as the talent that I would work with, I wanted every day to be a good day. I want to enjoy myself. I was in certain scenes where I'd meet the talent and I wouldn't be about it. <laughs> mm-hmm. I want to look, I wanted to look forward to shooting that day because I wanted to have sex with the person so that I could give the best scene possible other than just, okay, this is work. You know, I'm going to disassociate and just get through it and play a character. Mm-hmm. So is that just something that's always been like your personality type just to, I guess, know what, you needed to be happy and healthy or was there trial and error? No, that's always been my personality type. I've always been very much a, I need my space. I need my downtime. If I, I don't handle stress well, if Mm -hmm. I get too stressed out, then I kind of just curl up in a little ball and I start neglecting everything. Mm -hmm. Um, And I was at that point where I was canceling a lot of scenes and it just wasn't, it, it wasn't worth it to me. And I even, I haven't realized, um, you know, money isn't everything, even with feature dancing. I was feature dancing for a while, and I think that there was a month while I was feature dancing where I was on, like, 15 different flights that month. And flying is something that always kind of, like, uproots me because I I also like everything to be really organized Mm -hmm. at home. (laughs) And I like routine, and I like schedules. So I just got to a point where I decided, you know what? Money isn't everything. I'm going to do this right and I'm going to be happy while I do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm so glad you found that path because I feel like a lot of people don't, especially when you have these paychecks that are being thrown at you and you can find ways very easily to make those compromises because you're like, oh, well, it's just – you know, this just this one week or just this one scene or just this one club. And feature dancing is a great example because I don't know too many people that had – an overall great experience with that. For me, that was one of the worst things I have like ever done in my entire life. I thought it was super fun at first, but then it was like once you get on the circuit and you're doing, you know, two, three clubs a month or however, you know, much it was because at the time, at least for me, it was more lucrative than shooting. So it's like, of yeah. course I'll go do this. But the hours and the people that you're dealing with, in my case, like I did this one gig in um, Pittsburgh. Was it Pittsburgh? No, it was Baltimore. And I did a week. Seven days, um, every single night, 
and they didn't pay me at the end. Oh my God. I know. And I was like, I'm so done with this. I will never go back. And then like my agency at the time was like, oh, there's nothing we can really do. I was like, what do you mean? Um, And then I talked to a couple of other girls and they had a similar experience. So I was like, I'm just not doing this again. That's insane. Mm -hmm. For me, feature dancing, um, actually, it's funny because I was still doing it. I was just limiting how much I was doing it. But I went on a retreat and I did ayahuasca. Have you heard of that? Oh my gosh. Yes. I want to know all the details. Okay. So I went on an ayahuasca retreat and during that, like you just have, you have a lot of clarity. Mm -hmm. So during it, I was sitting there and I was kind of searching everything and feature dancing came up and I was like, you know what? I hate it. (laughs) I absolutely hate it. I hate everything about it. I hate having to buy the costumes. I hate having to travel. I hate having to stay up late. I hate the way that clubs smell like smoke. I hate giving lap dances. I hate getting on stage because I have stage fright. (laughs) And I also hate what it was doing to me because I hated it so much that when I would feature dance, I would get drunk. (laughs) I would always have to drink because I was so shy to go on stage and I I wasn't extroverted. So when I would drink, it would pull that out of me and I'd make a lot more money. So I was like, okay, this is the only way I'm getting through it. And so I hated that I was drinking so much as well. And I just like kind of made that resolve. I'm never going to feature dance ever again. I don't care who asked me? I don't care how much money it is. I'm not going to do even Sapphire, which are the easy clubs. I'm just not going to do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was, that was definite. That was what just kind of stopped it all. I just made it up in my mind during an ayahuasca ceremony. So what made you, cause that's intense. So I haven't, I'm trying to like prepare myself for a psychedelic experience. Cause I have a lot of control issues and I know that people that are very controlling and tends tend to have worse experiences because a lot of it is like letting go. So what drove you first to like go find one of these retreats? Because you get you can get really sick and they're very intense and unknown, which is very scary for people. So what was your main driving force for that? Um, I'll start off by saying I have control issues too which is something that I was worried about. And that is still what I struggle with because I've had a bit of experience with psychedelics um, Mm -hmm. even after ayahuasca. Uh, So what I was interested in, um, I I had never done, let's see. No, I did. I did acid one time before doing the ayahuasca ceremony. So I kind of had an idea of what psychedelics were. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a lot of experience with them. Um, but it was just something I kept hearing about. And I was hearing that people had life-changing experiences, that it was very spiritual, that for the most part, it was very safe. Um, and I guess I was just searching. I didn't have any specific reason, but I was just searching for, I was searching for a reason. I feel mm-hmm. like there's always more you can do to learn about yourself. Um, so it's just something that I always kind of wanted to dive into. And I pulled the trigger after I separated from my ex-husband, I was like, okay, I'm going to do this for myself. Um, And I found a really nice place in Brazil. What I liked about it was there was so many, there was so much information on it. There were so many reviews, there were hundreds of reviews uh, from people who had great experiences. There were pictures, there was videos, um, the woman who was in, who owns the retreat and is also in charge of the ceremony or the fact that she was a woman, because I would hear and read about horror stories of people you know, getting taken advantage of while they're under the influence of right. ayahuasca. So there was a lot of different factors um, to why I even chose that ceremony. And then I started seeing uh, my current boyfriend before I went and he ended up buying his ticket. So while we were still new in the relationship, we went together, (laughs) which I would say it was good. Um, It was good, but it was still uncomfortable just because it's a lot about vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Like before going into it, um, she's not a shaman, but she's, uh, she's worked with a lot of shamans and she was a psychotherapist before she bought her retreat and started performing ayahuasca ceremonies. So before going into it, uh, we would do as a group psychotherapy sessions. Um, and then that would kind of just 
open you up emotionally and then you set your intention. It's very like ceremonial. You're there. You don't talk when you show up to the ceremony room. You wear white. Um, you set your intention before going in. This is what I'm going to work on and focus. And then it, it really is important to try to let go. Um, something that I suffer with is and this is why I don't really like being under the influence of anything like even even weed I don't I, I will smoke weed on occasion but I shouldn't because uh, I I can <laughs> I get intrusive thoughts uh, and I think it's partly because I'm a little OCD mm -hmm. so like I'll get an image in my mind and then I'll draw significance to it and then it won't leave and I'll get a bunch of like um, under the influence, especially I'll get a bunch of like graphic disturbing images and thoughts that just disturb and distress me. And I start getting panic attacks. Uh, so that was something that would happen even during ayahuasca. Um, but I think part of, I, I guess like part of the lesson is to let these things happen. Let those thoughts, uh, pass through instead of like hiding away from them. Oh, I'm not going to do that because I get these thoughts and I get this way. It's no, I'm going to do it. And then I'm going to work through it mm -hmm. while I'm in that moment. Um, so I did have a couple nights of having panic attacks, <laughs> but it does actually work to just not draw significance and just kind of let whatever disturbs me just kind of flow through my brain and like look at it um, as a different person instead of drawing significance to it. Does that make sense? No, totally. I just analyze, okay, that's what I'm thinking about. That's fine. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, a, that's what a lot of like the spiritual books and teachings say, right? Is that like your body has all, all of these energy houses in, in them and you're not really supposed to judge any emotion that you feel because you need to let it just like experience it and then let it go and like let yeah. it – Right. Or you can like talk to yourself. You're like, hey, Melissa, it's okay. You're feeling, you're feeling jealous. You're feeling insecure. That'll pass. It's okay to feel that way. Why are you feeling that way? You know, mm -hmm. it's better than just like letting your mind go crazy and go where it wants to go. Mm -hmm. It kind of takes the, the control back in a way. What would you say is like the biggest thing that you learned from that experience? Um, I went into it a lot with, um, I kind of realized that my relationship with my mom wasn't the best. Um, even though I've always loved my mom so much, I was kind of enmeshed with her and I was carrying a lot of her issues and her problems on my back. Anything she felt, I kind of took it all on and I carried that around with me for her. So, and I was resenting her for it too. Um, so a big part of that was, I think I, I was able to kind of just separate myself from her. I did a lot of, a lot of thinking of, uh, about it and I haven't separated, you know, myself. I talk to her more than I used to. I just don't get involved like I used to. If she calls me and she's upset about something, I'll listen, but I don't feel I've kind of cut off the empathy. I don't know if it's a good way, but I kind of cut off the empathy a little bit so that I'm trying to, instead of feel what she's feeling and empathize with her, I'm trying to think outside the box and give her uh, better tips and directions to help better whatever situation she's in. Mm -hmm. No, that's, I think a problem like everyone has with at least one family member or someone, a friend that's closer. My mom's very similar where there's almost like this um, entanglement that you have. And it especially – like I don't know. Do you know a lot about um, like epigenetics or what they call like trans transgenerational um, trauma? Like have you heard either? I don't know a lot about it, but I do know what it is. Yeah. So the whole idea that you know, trauma can kind of go from like a grandmother to a mother to a daughter and specifically because of the way that reproduction is that it goes further down the line with women especially. Um, so that's why we tend to carry like the baggage of our mothers or we see like these patterns that kind of just like keep showing up and you kind of yeah. have to decide whether or not you're going to be the one to like break that cycle or not. Um, my mom, it's been like a whole – it's been like we did a – my husband and I, it's called BioCybernaut. And it's not like a psychedelic experience, but it's basically a boot camp for your brain for like a week. And it's like 
16 hour days. It's very long. It's very intense. Like I wanted to quit like every single day that I was there. Yeah. So like this is so intense. And they have you do a lot of forgiveness work. And then you start to kind of see the unhealthy or like the weak points in your relationships and then how you can fix them. And then once you almost have that detachment is when that relationship can start to heal and actually be healthier than you knew it could be. Agreed. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Well, as I've noticed a significant difference. Um, as so even forgiving, forgiving her, like I said, I was very subconsciously resentful over the baggage that I was carrying. Um, and as soon as I did kind of separate and I haven't went back to it, I, I, my, something just clicks in my head sometimes where I'm like, okay, that makes sense. That's what I'm going to do. Um, yeah, now I have a much better, much healthier relationship with her. And I've even noticed a change in her and how she behaves towards me. Mm-hmm. And I've noticed that she doesn't, she doesn't come to me and she doesn't want to put her like issues on me either. She does, she'll tell me sometimes what's going on, but I actually, I appreciate that. I think it's important for a mother daughter. I think that she has a husband, she has friends, she has people that she should go to mm-hmm. for certain things that she's going through rather than her daughter. Cause mm-hmm. I don't, I don't want to be a shoulder for or anybody like mm-hmm. their only, their only shoulder. Mm-hmm. It's not a healthy relationship to just dump emotions on somebody. Mm -mm. So after you did such a like vulnerable and like kind of um, unique experience with Eli, do you feel like that helped bond you guys? And then that's why you kind of have such a solid relationship is because you kind of started off on this very intense um, journey together? Um, I think it definitely helped because it, it helped me realize uh, we have a lot in common and we want a lot of the same things. We both really want to be the best versions of ourselves and we want to work on ourselves mentally and physically. Um, and I think that that's, that is one of the, the things that has kept us together is, you know, that we have something like that in common. So it seems like you both have like a growth mindset. So you both are always constantly trying to improve and you're open to new things. Um, How – this is a question I get all the time and I never really know how to answer it. So how do you make sure that you grow with your partner instead of like growing in opposite directions? Do you guys have like sit downs where you, you know, map out your future and like what you want and your goals together? How do you make sure that that you're growing together in the same direction? Um. I would say that's what we're doing. It hasn't some, it isn't something I've been consciously doing. (laughs) I think it's just been working out that way that we just do, we're just naturally going in the same direction. We do a lot of like exercises to make sure that we're like always on like the same page because he has his own businesses and I'm trying to like start, you know, podcasting and all of this and like just kind of map out like what's next for me. So we always have to try to like do just check it like check-ins if that makes sense I guess like that's the most important thing is just like checking in with your partner yeah I Mm -hmm. love that but to be honest I don't need to really set him down for a check-in I'm very vocal (laughs) if if I'm concerned about something if it pops into my head I'm like oh like sit down now we're gonna talk about this (laughs) that's amazing though I think it's great because not a lot of people are I guess um confident enough to always have like that open line of communication like they get scared or they just want to avoid it or maybe talk about it later so I think that's also a huge indicator if a if a relationship is going to be successful is just how open that communication is I think it's really good um I could work on my delivery a bit because I'm a little (laughs) blunt so does he help you out with your twitch or was that something that um you kind of wanted to get into after you stopped shooting like for mainstream like what uh what got you onto that platform he definitely helps me. Um, he helps me on the tech side of it, but it was 100% my thing, what I wanted to do. Um, and the reason why is I've always been, I've always been very nerdy. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I've always loved fantasy and I've always played video games, but I always felt bad for playing them because I, I would kind of just spend all day long playing a game. And afterwards, I'm like, oh, God, I didn't do this. I didn't do that. I'm wasting my life away. You're a piece <laughs> of shit. You know, go do something productive. 
Um, so I wasn't playing very much. And when I would be, I was feeling bad about myself. So I love the idea that with Twitch, I could play all these games that I want to play. And I'm actually building a platform and a business. I'm, I'm being productive while doing what I love. Mm-hmm. So that's what really got me into it. And I think that's why I've had some success on the platform is because mm-hmm. I genuinely love it. And I didn't really even expect it to turn into what it has turned into. I kind of thought I could just play my games and, you know, zone out. But a lot of it is interacting with your chat and your community. um, And that's something that I love about it, too, is I miss everybody. I miss interacting with everybody um, and, and helping to build that community. I actually haven't been able to stream since July. Oh, wow. Just because, yeah, the cabin that we moved into, I said it's in the middle of nowhere. Um, So the internet isn't very good. I only have satellite internet, which isn't um, enough to stream. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I think what I'm going to have to do is uh, probably just get another place, maybe 30 minutes away or something to to set up my stream and just kind of like go there a couple days a week. Oh, so you're totally committed to figuring it out. Oh, 100%. Oh, that's I'm, awesome. I'm itching. I can't even tell you. I'm itching to get back. I miss it so much. That's actually, I'd say more so, I, I wouldn't say I'm passionate about pornography. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'd say I'm passionate about my Instagram because um, I really love, uh, I love photography and I love modeling and I love creating photos that I'm happy about or, or I'm inspired about. Mm-hmm. Um, and I love, I'm passionate about Twitch. Those are the two platforms for me. So when you started Twitch, it was mostly just because you wanted to kind of um, go into a a hobby or like a passion that you had already had, like you weren't looking at it as a pivot necessarily? No, I wasn't. Not originally. Mm -hmm. Not originally. It was definitely – it was definitely going to be a side thing for me and it it just turned into – more of a a main thing and Mm -hmm. it it will go back to that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, I will as soon as I, I get set up, I'll, I'll put a lot more effort into it. So how has that changed your plans for the future or has it? Like what are – what's next for Mia Malkova? Um, it, so Twitch is still going to be a second thing for me. It's not – definitely um, not as profitable for someone like me as like my only fans. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, like I said, I do it because I love it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that in the future, if I keep going with it and that's something that I did want to become my main thing, it would, it could potentially be very profitable mm-hmm. next for me. Um, honestly, I'm, I'm intrigued by the idea of putting more effort into YouTube. Mm-hmm. So I think that that's the next platform I'm going to, I'm going to start, uh, shooting for and kind of like putting on my roster every month what kind of stuff like videos do you plan on putting on there I definitely want to put highlights from when I do stream but I'm doing I'm doing research now I think vlogging um (laughs) would be popular when I do do things I think even just uh fun videos that I've noticed people want to see are things like a day in the life, like just to see what I do all day, which (laughs) people are going to be surprised. I don't do a lot, (laughs) but they still like house tours, like a day with the puppies. I have like a long list of, um, still ideas, even, even, you know, doing my makeup every day. There's, I, I feel like it's so funny what people want to see. I feel like it's not very entertaining, but I think that what they like is that it's more personal. You're seeing the real person behind the camera. It makes a ton of sense to me, but there's so many people that would like advise against that or they think, you know, you're supposed to only be this sex symbol and you're not allowed to be anything else. So have you had like any feedback or like negative feedback or even self-talk that's like, ooh, you know, maybe I should stay in this lane that is just this – you know, super sexy Instagram girl. So much self-talk. Oh, it's, it's, oh, I'm very insecure. Um, I think that my personality, I really like who I am, but I think I'm kind of different in the sense that 
I feel like I'm a little old lady stuck in a young hot girl's body. <laughs> I, I like to, you know, read books and go to bed early and play with my puppies and I clean and I like hiking and, you know, being mindful in nature. And I don't really like vibe with what's popular mm-hmm. nowadays. Like the music that I listen to is Broadway and, you know, Celtic women. <laughs> I don't listen to any of the music nowadays. Um, so I do get very insecure that, um, people will see my personality think, oh, she's weird. You know, she's weird. Mm -hmm. She's quirky. I'm not, I'm not really vibing with it. Mm -hmm. Um, but what I have noticed from Twitch, which is probably one of the reasons I love it so much is I am completely myself on there because I'm, I'm live for four to six hours. I've done a 24 hour stream (laughs) where I've slept on stream before. Um, and it's just me. So I am, I am perfectly myself. I'm comfortable in my room. I don't have like stage fright. I'm not trying to really impress anybody. Um, and I've gotten just great feedback from it. It's, it's made me a lot more comfortable showcasing who I am. Yeah. Twitch is great for that. I did it for, um, probably like a year or something back when like the IRL section was really big. Um, so I mostly did like cooking and drinking and red wine. Like that was my thing. And then yeah. we got pregnant. So it was just not a priority at the time. Um, but it's really cool because you get you get a different community than you get on other social media platforms, which I feel like can tend to lean toxic if you know where to look. You know what I mean? Like on Twitter, like Twitter is one of those places that you can – really lose faith in humanity if you look in the yeah. right channels. But with Twitch, it's like everyone is this little family. I'm in love with the community. I even noticed on my Twitter when I got into Twitch, everyone is so much kinder to me. Instead of, I feel like I feel like the porn um followers who come, you know, who who come from like Pornhub or, or whatever, I feel like a lot of it's very derogatory. Mm-hmm. But Twitch, they're just all about building you up. Oh, queen, we love you. Yeah. <laughs> and they want to know more about your personality. And then if someone is mean to you, like they all, you know, gang up on that one person. So it's not like rewarded to be a troll on there. Where exactly. on, on exactly. Twitter, it's like who can throw the biggest rock at somebody? <laughs> you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, the community is wonderful. So what would some advice be, um, I guess, to a, a girl that's either in the industry or like – um, thinking about leaving the industry and just trying to explore other options because you're one of the few examples, and I think I said this when I asked you to come on, that kind of create – like intentionally or not, you pivoted in a very healthy, positive way, right? Like you showed that you can be successful outside of porn and you can be more than just a body. And I think that's so inspiring and a lot of other women would love to hear like how you did it or any advice um, in moving forward. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess advice I would have is I think it's really about following what you're passionate about. And I think that especially like new girls coming into the industry, I think that if they're anything like me, (laughs) they might be passionate about it. You know, it might be all new and exciting and, you know, they they just want to be on set. They want to you know, work with this person. If they want to just mingle in the adult industry, I, I really just think follow what you're passionate about. It doesn't mean you're going to stay passionate about that. Mm -hmm. Um, I do like the fact that I've seen more and more women, um, in the adult industry becoming since OnlyFans and Snapchat and all of that becoming entrepreneurs. And I think that that's not just translating from the veterans have been in it for a long time, but I think it's translating over to the new girls too. They all have I see that they have Twitches and or Twitch and YouTubes and they're trying to kind of even Instagram. I've noticed a big change in girls on Instagram where they're treating it more like a business as opposed to just like a personal, a personal platform Mm -hmm. doing a lot more photo shoots, getting creative with their content and being their, I don't know, just being creative. Mm -hmm. I I love seeing it when people are creative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. 
Well, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I um, do want to say thank you for giving me your time on the podcast and letting us get to know you a little bit. And uh, do you want to tell the listeners where they can follow you and how they can support you, like your tw- Twitch stream, all that good stuff? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It was really great, like, catching up with you. And I'm glad that you're doing so well. Thank you. Beautiful, as always. You do, you too. Aged a day. <laughs> <laughs> and your body bounced back after your baby, which is – Super, like, great for you. Breastfeeding. If you ever do it, it's the easiest way. I didn't Calories. Right? So many. Yeah. I, I still haven't started dieting yet, so it's all just from breastfeeding. Oh, my God. Yeah. I'm, like, getting thicker right now because the gyms <laughs> and everything are closed. So thank you for having me on. You guys can follow me on Instagram, which is at Mia underscore Malkova, Twitter, Mia Malkova, and then Twitch, which is at Mia Malkova. And Twitch is free to watch, by the way. Awesome. Well, thank you again. Um, We'll have to do this again in the future. That's it for this week's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have the time, please rate and review, and you can always hit subscribe to stay up to date with our latest episodes. I hope to have you back.